All right. So today we'll talk about data-intensive applications. And so, as you might guess, we work with data. And to be honest, I think most of typical applications we work with uh, mostly are data-intensive, especially if you work with databases. And so, most likely, your first application architecture will be very simple. So you'll have some kind of microservice in Python or Node, some kind of database like Postgres or MySQL, maybe a cache like Redis and Memcache, and some kind of message queue to do asynchronous processing. So the reason why you don't really need some kind of highly performant language like Java for microservices is because most of the time your application will be waiting for a database. So as long as it can do parallel requests to the database, that's a perfectly good architecture, and we definitely started with this. But then time, time passes by, and we end up with a much more complicated situation. So what happens? Uh, first, uh, the requirements change. So assuming you become more successful or you have lots of data to manage, scalability requirements increase. You need to ensure reliability of your system, uh, availability, and also think about things like maintainability and evolving your system, because you collect data, data is immutable, time goes on, you still need to process it, so evolvability of a system actually becomes pretty important. So here is a list of challenges which you might consider and which you might actually meet in your reality. Like at some point, your database will not be able to process enough requests or transactions per second, and so you will have to partition it. Or like literally, the data just will not fit into one instance of your Postgres and MySQL, and voila, you're at the same situation. Again, uh, reliability and availability probably means your database will have to be replicated, and uh, also you will need to think about failover. At some point, just running your SQL queries like joins will be inefficient, and you will start denormalizing your database. And uh, well, for instance, in our case, we actually at some point start processing like 100K events per second from IoT devices, and probably you don't want to store them to Postgres, like transaction by transaction, it becomes too slow. Your historical data starts approaching like a petabyte of data, and again, probably Postgres is not the right place for it. And in the end, you want to run large analytical queries. So what happens is that eventually, five years later, you end up with something like that. So we'll talk how you get there, but very briefly, well, you still have some kind of microservices. You still have a message queue like Rabbit, but probably you will introduce some kind of event log or topic like Kafka. Uh, you will have a bunch of uh, computational frameworks like workflow, batch, and streaming. We'll talk about differences, but the main idea is basically that they work at different time granularity. Uh, workflow works like minutes, batch, seconds, streaming, hopefully hundreds of milliseconds. And you will have a bunch of specialized data stores for different uses, like in memory store, like operational store, like a typical database, search serving uh, where you store pre-computed uh, things needed to answer your queries, analytical store like a data warehouse, and maybe some kind of object store for storing large volumes of data like S3. So how do we get there? Um, so first you will have some kind of uh, message broker, which is, for instance, RabbitMQ. What you will discover is that RabbitMQ, like probably you can do 10,000 messages per second, but beyond that, it will not really work for you. That is at least my experience. Another thing is that the moment the total volume of messages is larger than available RAM, again, RabbitMQ becomes slow. So I'll try to convince you that uh, Kafka and event log based on Kafka is a much more scalable solution if you want to process lots of lots of events. So how does the message broker work? So hopefully you all know this, so we'll get to more interesting stuff in a moment, but Imagine we have a queue, messages arrive there, you have a bunch of workers which consume from the queue, but importantly, each message in the queue is processed by exactly one worker. Uh, if you actually want to have a, two groups of consumers which see the same messages, you will have to create some kind of exchange or a fan out. In Kafka, things work differently. Uh, what it does is that literally it creates a bunch of partitions, and uh, for each event, there is a deterministic function which tells you into which partition it goes. And each partition is literally a append-only file with uh, offsets. And, uh, well, when you send new messages or events to a partition, they are just added to this file. And when you want to read data from Kafka partition, you just say that, I, don't, I, don't, I want partition number one and read from offset four, 
and you just start reading. So pretty much your throughput is limited by how fast your hard drives can read and write. So uh, in Kafka, you can easily store terabytes of data, and you can process millions of events per second, which is uh, pretty good, but it's basically a different architecture, also different use case. And uh, especially thinking of schema evolution, you'll have to think about the formats of your messages. And uh, the good formats are like protocol buffers, Thrift or Avro. They allow you to describe how, uh, let's say, you wrote data in one schema, like one year, and then two years later, you want actually to read it. And so Avro actually literally allows you to define read and write schemas. And Kafka has a schema registry which allows you to actually specify which uh, Avro schema is applied to which Kafka topic, which is pretty nice. So the next thing you will get to is probably some kind of workload processing system. How do you get there? Uh, typically, you have some kind of use case where you take data from some database, like operational database, and you need to copy it to a data warehouse. Maybe you want to join it with some more data from other source. Maybe you want to transform. So it's like a typical extract, transform, load job. Uh, so the way it looks like is that uh, pretty much your job is uh, a DAG, a graph. There are some steps or tasks, and there are data dependencies. Uh, so basically what happens is that first there is a trigger. It's either some kind of event which is sent to the API of the workflow processing system or a time trigger, like every hour. And it starts this DAG, and then it's processed. Well, imagine that the time goes in that direction. So when the preconditions for a given stage uh, are fulfilled, you can start the next stage. Here ha happens the parallel processing, and then in the end you, do, like, you wait when they finish. Again, pretty basic stuff, right? And the interesting systems here are Airflow or Luigi. If you don't know them, I suggest you check them out. Uh, very often, the workflow processing systems are used to schedule the batch processing systems. For people who are taking the pictures of my slides, I appreciate that, but they will be shared. So, well, maybe it's me, I don't know. Maybe you're taking pictures of me. Uh, but we will be filming, so you will get these pictures too. Um, Batch processing. So batch processing is largely about uh, executing distributed computational jobs. And the main abstraction is a distributed partition data set. In the case of Spark, it's called RDD, Resilient Distributed Data Set. I will not explain all Spark in one minute, but I will try to give you the idea. So basically, it's a computational job. It has a beginning, some inputs, like this is one data set, this is another. And it has some outputs, another data set, basically. And each data set is essentially partitioned into some, well, partitions. And the idea is that different partitions can live on different nodes of your computer cluster. And uh, again, you have data dependencies. And basically, there are two kinds of data dependencies. You can have either narrow dependencies, where the next data set is partitioned the same way as the previous one. Then you can compute the next partition from the previous one. Or the more complicated case where you basically each partition depends on a piece of information in each previous partition. And it's called a shuffle. So this is actually how MapReduce can be implemented internally. It looks very simple, but it's very hard inside. Luckily, we get it for free using some kind of DSL. And uh, yeah, pretty much what Spark does is it schedules these uh, small tasks, like probably will do OK when your tasks are even like one second. Like I think scheduling latency, like 100 milliseconds or something. And uh, well, typical use case is that you shuffle two data sets and then you join them. And then you produce the result. And the typical use cases for Spark are, well, basically, again, ETL. Very often, like the workflow scheduler calls Spark jobs to actually do the, the stuff. Um, you can actually use Spark to execute distributed SQL. So if you want to analyze large volumes of data, you can write a SQL query. It's compiled to a Spark job, and then it's run in a distributed manner. You can analyze lots of uh, stuff in re reasonably e efficient time. And yes, you can also use it to train machine learning models. And uh, good examples of technologies are Hadoop MapReduce, Spark, and if you're a European Union uh, patriot, then Flink. 
which is actually pretty nice. Now we get to stream processing. Um, so stream processing is basically continuous uh, version of batch processing. It uh, doesn't stop. And the latency of your processing is maybe 100 milliseconds to one second. And uh, well, you can process 100k events per second or even more. Um, the way to think about stream processing is pretty much um, it is equivalent of running a SQL query, but you're running it on event streams instead of tables. And you know, like in SQL, you have filter, map, join, aggregate, and so on. So here is a nice picture which is supposed to illustrate that. So you have two uh, streams, a stream of payments and a stream of orders. Uh, and you have a stateful join buffer. What it does is that it remembers, for instance, like, I don't know, the payments and the orders of the last day. And if they match, it sends out an email. And uh, this thing is stateful, and in some systems, actually, you can restart, and it will remember the state. So it's essentially a streaming SQL join. And, um, well, yeah, typical systems for that are Spark streaming, Flink. I personally are a big fan of Kafka streams and Kafka SQL. So you literally can write a SQL query. You can treat the streams as tables, and uh, on the output, you will get updates to the results set of your SQL query, which I think is pretty nice. And so the typical use cases are data enrichment, streaming ETL, event detection, and session analysis. So now we get the philosophical part. We're done with simple stuff. Uh, any comments, questions? OK, philosophy it is. Uh, so I think the most important like, way to look at this thing, how to build distributed data processing systems, is uh, immutable event log and denormalization of state. Uh, I will show you a much less theoretical picture, but I will first show you a theoretical picture. In two of the next slides, everything will fall into place. So there are many fancy names for this idea, like event sourcing and command query responsibility separation and, and so on and so on. But I think uh, one very nice way to view at this is unbundled database. And the idea is, is that in traditional database, your writes come in, they are written to the leader, uh, the master of database, and then uh, somehow they are replicated to the slaves or followers. Well, essentially, your transaction log of the master database is copied over to the follower. Uh, now, in the philosophical unbundled, unbundled database, what happens is that you have events. Um, which basically represent your writes. Uh, then there is some kind of streaming transform. You get transformed events. Uh, and then you know, in a database, you actually run SQL queries. You maybe update some indexes and so on. So in unbundled database, basically, all your queries are materialized. So you get a materialized streaming join, materialized uh, streaming aggregation, uh, materialized uh, streaming view. I'm sure nobody understood anything. That's why I have specific examples. So that's a traditional database use case. And let's think what happens here. So first, uh, generally good practice is to separate a microservice which modifies the state of your application and a microservice which responds to complex, que complex queries about the state of your application. So what happens here is that uh, there is a command microservice which modifies the operational store like a Postgres. And then there is a qu query microservice which runs some complicated joins or whatever on the operational store to actually return data to the user. Um, now, maybe you have also event microservice which generates a bunch of events, and for some reason you're also storing them in the operational store initially. That's your first design. And maybe you have a workflow scheduler. Mm, it runs some jobs periodically. They query the operational store, and if they detect something which is worth reporting, then they send notifications to a message broker such as RabbitMQ. So hopefully this is a relatively familiar setup for you, like nothing new here. So what is the problem with this setup? Uh, a certain load of your system, there will be too many writes. Uh, your joins and queries will be hitting the same database which is serving the writes. And essentially your system will get overloaded. Um, <laughs> Also, it's relatively harder to extend the system because everything happens in the same database, so kind of everything is interconnected, and also scaling this thing is harder. On the bright side, uh, you can update everything in one transaction as long as you're not partitioning the database, which is kind of nice. 
So, uh, especially if you want to have a large organization, large volumes of data, you end up with this very simple system. So, the uh, first thing you do is you basically have a separate operational store and a separate serving store. And uh, the idea is that, uh, well, we still have the command service, right, which uh, modifies the operational store. But uh, to respond to the queries, we actually pre-compute some stuff, and we store this pre-computed stuff in the serving store. And now the query microservice can query this service and uh, store, and it can uh, respond to queries much more efficiently, A. B, it's completely decoupled from uh, operational store. So A, you get much more flexibility, and it's much easier to scale. Also, like maybe you will have uh, two different serving stores for different purposes, for different use cases. You can use different teams, and so on and so on. Um, and so the idea is that basically, you can imagine that this is, for instance, uh, a Kafka Streams, well, network of applications. And so what you do here is it's called change data capture. Um, so the way change data capture works is that it reads, it reads your transaction log, and it produces events for each uh, create, update, and insert of each individual row. And these messages go into the event stream. It's actually a pretty common architectural pattern. And I think it's even used in some Estonian large companies. And now when you have the event stream and all modifi modifications of your operational store, well, you can do the usual stuff. You can transform it. You can join it with whatever other stream you need. And then you have some kind of aggregation job, which, well, aggregates some information. And when some triggers are triggered, you actually can send out notifications. So well, the downside is that the system is eventually consistent. There are no transactions anymore. So when somebody does something like a command here, well, it takes some time to, for this to propagate here, for instance. So pros and cons. Sure, but what you write there is uh, you can pre-compute joins, for instance, right? So if uh, on this picture, like if you want to query something, right, like you either have to denormalize it here, right, and you're hitting the same database, or you have to like run the joins here, right? Here you basically separate this thing uh, into two parts. Yes, exactly. And it's also, like, you can use different kind of technology, right? So this can be a Postgres, and this can be, I don't know, Cassandra, for instance, because it doesn't need to process transactions. Can you speak a bit louder? So uh, I think with machine learning, your first question is, do you need Spark? Because very often, you can take a big machine, and you can use some kind of scikit-learn or TensorFlow, right? And you can do it in one machine. So uh, the sad truth is, is actually the moment you start doing it distributed, yes, it's very distributed and parallel and failover and stuff, but actually it becomes much less efficient. So if you can train your machine learning, learning models on one machine, the, there is a huge performance boost. So, Fun fact to know. Um, I guess it really also depends like what kind of model you're training, right? So, like for instance, if it's actually a neural network, you need to have some kind of parameter server probably, and it will be aggregating your gradients, like taking average of them, right? And so on. So I imagine that maybe random forests are very nice to train with Spark. I'm not sure, like gradient boosted trees, I would need to think. It's it's not trivial to parallelize it, I think. Maybe some people actually know. Under doesn't want to answer. I, I don't know, did I answer your question or some other questions? Good. 
So, um, now we come to my favorite topic called choosing the data stores. Um, so one thing is that you need to think what kind of workload you're choosing your data store for. So there are all kinds of different workloads, like caching, uh, transactional, like a typical database. Uh, do you want to index data and then search? Or maybe you want to, like we discussed, serve the data to the users. Maybe you want to run analytical queries, and so on and so on. And um, you want to think about uh, the data structures, like is it read or write optimized, and what kinds of queries it actually supports. So if you actually need spatial search, like by a polygon, then your database better support it. Um, yeah, and then the fun topic like replication, partitioning, transactions, and in distributed stores, there is this everlasting trade-off between consistency and availability, which we'll talk in the end of my slides. And here is a very nice picture which bears absolutely no information on content, but I think penguins are awesome. So, um, data store zoo. Um, so there are different ways to classify data stores. I'm sorry if I didn't mention your favorite data store. Uh, this is one possible classification. So there are all kinds of in-memory caches and grids. So in-memory grid is basically an in-memory cache with very fancy coordination data structures. Check them out. It might be useful for you. Uh, then there are two kinds of relational SQL stores. There are analytical and sort of transaction processing. So the transaction processing stores are like MySQL and Postgres. They process lots of small transactions. I would say 10,000 transactions per one machine, roughly, is the best case. Uh, and all of stores actually uh, process large volumes of data. There are not that many queries, but each query is very expensive. So well, examples are like Redshift or Vertica or Hive. Hive is actually built on top of Hadoop and Spark, but it looks like a data warehouse. Like you can connect your BI tool to Hive, you can enter the SQL and it will be run. Uh, then uh, NoSQL databases, or how some cynical people call them, not yet SQL databases. Uh, so all kinds of key value store like Redis or React. Uh, the main point is that literally you have a key and a value and there is no implicit ordering or structure. So you're, it's your job to do anything you want with that. Uh, then there are white column stores where you have a row key and a column key. And usually the data is sorted by row key and then by column key, which can be very useful if you want to do all kinds of range queries. And you could even do spatial indexing if you really want to. Um, document stores like MongoDB, Elastic. So the idea is, is that you can store your document, like a JSON document, and then uh, it makes it really easy to navigate this document or query the documents by some indexes. Like, for instance, Elastic creates secondary indexes called inverted indexes, where for each term which is present somewhere in the document, it has a list of document IDs, so you can very easily find uh, which documents match your search query. And finally, there is like an infinite set of specialized data stores, like time series, graph, and so on and so on. And object stores, like S3, yeah, we have a data store, that's true. Um, I think it's time series store, if you think of it. Yes. Uh, anyways, um, S3 is a typical object store. Technically, HDFS is a file system, but you can only append to files and only in roughly 100 megabyte blocks. So it's pretty much an object store. Anybody wants to tell something about their favorite data store or has a question? Cool. So, uh, data structures. So basically, the two main data structures in data stores are B trees and log structured merge trees. And the trade off is basically whether you want to optimize for random reads or random writes. Um, so, okay, now I broke it. All right, can you hear me? Good. So basically, B tree is a balanced search tree. As you can see, the elements here are in the order, in order. But importantly, each block or each node is four kilobyte size. So it's basically optimized for working with I.O. systems. So usually, the balanced tree has like two elements, one to the left or the right. Here, you have more like 1,000 elements. And uh, yeah, 
it is optimized for random reads. Random writes are less efficient because you basically have to touch the whole path on these blocks. Um, this is the most common data structure in classical databases like MySQL or Postgres. You should definitely know about it. And then there is log structured merge trees, which is like a default data structure for key value stores. And it basically trades off that random writes are more optimal and the reads are less optimal because you have to touch many files. So basically, each rectangle here, or actually triangle, is a B tree. But these B trees are never modified, at least once they are written to disk. So you first accumulate some amount of writes in memory let's say 16 megabytes, and it's called a mem table. And when it's ready, it's written out to disk, and, uh, well, basically kept this way. And when you have, let's say, 16 files here of size, let's say 16 megabytes, then you write out one larger file here by merging these 16 trees together. And when you have, uh, let's say, 16 files here, you can do it again. So the idea is, is that uh, the size of these files grows exponentially, but at each level, you don't have more than 16 files. And uh, what it means is that uh, writes are very cheap. You just uh, add more stuff here, and you don't have to modify any of these structures. But now, uh, during reads, you actually have to check all these files, whether your key is there. Uh, there are tricks to optimize it, because they use something like Bloom filter. But let's not go there. Yeah, definitely you should know about it. And uh, it's very good for range scans. But after merging this one, the two triangles, do you do that? Yes, yes. So you merge the 16 triangles into one larger one, and then you, you can forget about the old ones. The leads are done so that you write a special tombstone, which says that this key was deleted. Uh, the problem is, is that you can end up with lots of lots of tombstones across these files before they are merged together. Because when you merge, you can drop the data. Uh, which means that it looks that there is no data, but actually the database has to read through all the tombstones and then tell you, no, there is no data. So it actually can take a lot of time, and it's quite painful. So uh, you should definitely look for compacting data in this case. There is also something called major compaction, which is not a very good design decision, I think, but in the end, I think, periodically, HBase just compacts all files together, like once a week or something. That's when it doesn't work very fast. And so writes are completely asynchronous, right? So writes just, uh, first they write to memory. When there are 16 megabytes, you create a new file, right? And completely in the background, the compaction takes the first 16 files here and makes them into the next file, right? So there is no blocking anywhere. Also good for concurrency. So another thing you should know is columnar storage. Uh, so your analytical databases will... Uh, represent data differently than key value stores or OLTP databases. So that is how a typical database stores data. Each row, values, columns are stored together. So you first store this column, then this column, and then this column. Uh, in the columnar storage, things are reverted. So you store each column separately. So first this column, then this, and so on. The idea is, is that, A, you can comp compress them much better, because the, the values are much more repeating. Uh, B, if there is like 100 columns, which is very common for data warehouses, and you just want three columns, then you can only read the columns you care about. So there is a lot of like saving space in that sense. And finally, actually, what happens is that these columns are split into chunks, and for each chunk, you memorize a minimum and maximum value. And if you have a filter like, I don't know, age greater than 20, and you know that the maximum value of, of this field in this chunk is... 16, you can just skip over the whole chunk, which is pretty good. Yeah, and so uh, the typical formats you probably heard about are Parquet or Orc, and the typical analytical databases are Redshift, Vertica, and Hive. Yeah, so this is the end of the serious part of my presentation. Well, let's say detailed part of my presentation. Um, any comments, questions? Good. I would guess it is click storage. I think so, but I wouldn't promise you that. Druid is also, I think, column storage.
I need to work on this. OK, so um, now I will do the impossible feed. I will explain your last 50 years of distributed systems and databases in four slides. Um, these are two very famous people, both are Turing Award winners, which have pretty much invented everything, like transactions, distributed systems. So at least you should know their names. So uh, more penguins. Replication. Uh, so pretty much the default case is that you have a database, like a Postgres. It has a master and a bunch of slaves. At some point, your master dies, and now the question is, like, how do you promote another slave to a master? The problem is, is that uh, the fact that you think that the master is dead doesn't mean that uh, everybody else thinks that the master is dead. Because you know, maybe your communication to the master is bad, but you know, other nodes actually can communicate with your master. So first, you need to decide that the master has died. And B, you have to make sure that once you promote one of the slaves to be a master, the first master cannot communicate anymore. This is something called fencing, and this is very important in databases. And uh, so there are two options for doing it. So one is called, it's a very nice name, called shoot the other node in the head. So you use some kind of infrastructure or hardware facility to basically shut down the communication to the node. So it can pretend that it's a master, nobody cares because nobody sees him anymore. And then you can, well, flip over the switch and say that some of the other Slaves is now the master. And uh, the more fancy way is epoch numbers, where every, every time a leader is elected, he gets a sequence number. When you elect a new leader, the sequence number changes. So if you tell the slaves that the sequence number has changed, it can ignore the messages from the old uh, leader because it has a smaller epoch number. Does it make sense? Good. Yeah, so a bit more bizarre is multi-reader replication, which is technically supported in databases, but I don't think you should use it. So I think technically in Postgres, you can do so that if there are two masters, you can write to both of them, they will synchronize things, except that when there is write-write conflict, there is no idea what to do. So maybe you shouldn't do it. But there are interesting cases like write conflict resolution in Google Docs. So Google Docs can work offline, and if two people edit the same document, you will have to somehow reconcile their changes. Uh, there's a very cool system called the operational transform. So if you're interested, check it out. And finally, more common is leaderless replication, where let's say if we take Cassandra, like maybe there are like five nodes or three nodes which could potentially store a given key. And uh, maybe one of these nodes is down anymore, or maybe you just can't communicate with them. So maybe you wrote your data to two of the nodes. Now, if you read from just one of the nodes of these three, then it might happen that you're reading the old data because uh, you wrote to nodes A and B, but you're reading from C. But if the read quorum, it's called quorum, and the write quorum are larger than the number of, well, essentially the replication number, uh, then you are guaranteed to see the freshest data. So it's basically, let's say if you have uh, three nodes keeping a given key, then uh, if your read and write quorums are two, you're fine. In terms and conditions apply. In practice, in this setup, Cassandra can lose data because uh, the cluster can partition into two parts if there is communication issues. And then you can actually write the same key, keys in two partitions. And when the cluster merges or heals, one of them will be lost, which may or may not be what you want. So it's a trade-off. And there is another very cool math, which I will not tell you about, called CRDT. It's used in ACA cluster and React, but the idea is basically that it can reconcile uh, writes which happened independently by merging them together using some kind of operation, which means that there is such operation. And finally, what you need to think about is consistency of your reads. Um, so you may or may not know that in S3, it used to be so that if you write a data to a key and it is replicated across regions, there is no guarantee that you actually will see the data uh, if you immediately read this key. They have fixed this part. So if you write to the new key and then immediately read it, then the data will actually come back. But if you overwrite the old key and immediately read this uh, old key, you might actually get the stale data. So something to think about. There are more fancier consistency levels, but you know, something to think about when you work with S3, for instance. Partitioning. Yes, lots of penguins. Um, you pretty much 
first partitioning happens when your data doesn't fit in one computer, right? And you need to decide how to partition. And your options are you either hash the key and uh, then use the hash of the key to decide which uh, partition it goes to, or you can use a key range. So basically, you, you have the whole space of keys, you split it into ranges, and each range is essentially served by a separate region server. And so, for instance, Cassandra or Elastic, uh, they pretty much use hash partitioning, and HBase uh, or Bigtable, which are very similar, they use uh, key range partitioning. Um, the advantage of key range partitioning is that you can do range scans, so you can ask, give me keys between A and B, uh, efficiently, but with hash partitioning, there you cannot do range scans, at least on the part which is hash partitioned, because well, there is no order. But you need to think about the hotspots um, in HBase and actually also in S3. Uh, they use uh, region uh, key range partitioning, and so if, uh, for instance, all your keys start with the, uh, I don't know, the same prefix like all your reads and writes will be hitting only one partition, especially in S3. Uh, so if you have very high load on S3, what you should do is you should do salting. You should add a hash of part of your key to the beginning of your key, because otherwise uh, you will be basically throttled at certain levels of throughput. Fun fact. All right, uh, then there is partitioning and indexes. Uh, um, two options. You either partition by document, which means that you store secondary index uh, next to the document in the same partition, uh, which is nice. Uh, Elastic and Cassandra do that, but this means that if you run a query, like in Elastic, like find documents with this word, this query will go into every shard or partition. So basically, it will hit every server, and then you will have to merge results together, which may or may not be what you want. And uh, partitioning by term basically means that you essentially create a new table which is indexed by the term. Um, and probably your document will be on one computer, but the term will sit on another computer, which means that the updates are eventually consistent. And if the term is very popular, like and, then you will be terribly hotspotting this, well, this term, very popular one. So again, pros and cons. It's useful to think what happens when you need to repartition your data. Um, pretty much most of the systems by now allow you repartitioning the data, which means that, uh, let's say you start with four partitions, but later decide let's increase it to eight. You pretty much can convince even Elastic by now. It, isn't, it used to be the case that for Elastic, the number of partitions is fixed. Now you can actually ask it, please increase it twice. Uh, but for Kafka, actually, partitioning is still fixed. So one simple trick is your over partition. So maybe right now you need just four partitions, but you create 32 partitions, but they sit on four computers. And when there is too much load, you add four more computers and you move some partitions away from these four computers. So it's a simple over partitioning trick. Um, so there are some interesting algorithms for how partitioning and replication work together. I recommend you check out consistent hashing, which is pretty much used in very many uh, key value stores and in most content distribution networks. Like the main issue is basically when nodes join and leave the network, you want to make sure that you don't have to move around too much data. I'll spare you the details. All right. Again, transactions is something I will not tell you about. Hopefully you learned it at school. Uh, so, you know, acid, atomic, atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. Uh, here is a picture of uh, banking, supposedly. So they usually say that banking is a good example of transactions. As far as I know, actually, banking is usually eventually consistent. Maybe people who have worked in banking can confirm or deny that. No? No comment. Anyways, I think usually like, it doesn't happen immediately in one transaction. The data is removed from one account and then moved to the other. It's more like, you remove data from one account, it goes to some kind of message queue, and maybe later it's added to another. That is my impression. So, I mean, I'm pretty sure that in a global scale, banking is more like eventually a consistent system than transactional. But it's always used as an example. Um, the key value stores usually provide you single object transactions like check and put. So you check uh, what is the current value of the key, and you allow it to update it. So, like, HBase allows it. 
Cassandra kind of allows it, but the throughput is not very good. And yeah, there is a bunch of isolation levels you should know about, but I will not teach you them because you should already know them. And the last slide, the most interesting slide where I, I condensed 40 years of distributed systems into one slide, uh, two interesting problems. One is called distributed consensus. It's whether, let's say, multiple computers on asynchronous network can agree on the value of single bit of information. Like, for instance, whether to commit or roll back a transaction. And there is a famous result that it is not possible. However, don't despair. Not everything is lost. Well, in practice, things like Zookeeper and ETCD, which are like service discovery, lock servers, and even Bitcoin can actually do consensus in practice. Although, I think on paper it shouldn't work, but it works. Uh, so basically, usually, like, the approaches are very different, like Bitcoin does proof of work. I don't know anything about crypto, so I can't really comment too much, but my impression is, is that the hash at the end of the crypto ledger is basically the subject of distributed consensus. Yes, and usually the main abstraction there, again, is a distributed log, or how they say now, distributed ledger, which is basically a mutable sequence of events such that all participants see the, sequ the same sequence in the same order. Another theorem which is useful to think about but is maybe a bit misleading is called cap theorem, which basically says that let's say you have a cluster of five nodes, a database, and let's say that the network partition happened and now you have two partitions with two nodes and three nodes. And now uh, what do you do? And you basically have to choose. Either you remain consistent and you refuse the writes or even reads on this minority partition or you choose availability and you actually accept rights on the minority partition. But now uh, you can accept conflicting rights on two partitions. And uh, well, then when they merge, well, probably last writer wins, but I'm not sure if that's what you want. Uh, so it is not fashionable anymore to say that uh, your system is CP and AP. Well, it's fashionable. It's now it's supposed to say that you have to think of consistency and latency trade-offs case by case. But having said that, uh, like there are like basically two philosophies. There are AP systems like Elastic, Cassandra, and ACA cluster, which basically keep working if the network partition happens. And there are CP systems like Kafka, HBase, or Cassandra lightweight transactions, which on network partition, the minority partition doesn't work anymore. And finally, there is lots of cool new databases coming out, which kind of push the boundary further. Uh, they uh, are distributed, they do transactions. These transactions are linearizable, which means that it's the highest level of isolation in distributed setting. Uh, and they support SQL. So apparently you can't have everything if you really want to. There are some trade-offs, like for instance, Google Spanner, uh, they run a distributed network of atomic clocks with precision of 10 milliseconds. And they have uh, custom links between their data centers. And that's why Google Spanner can do what it does. There are other databases like CockroachDB basically trades off uh, read latency, so it's, it, it does similar things to Spanner, but it is much slower in reads. FarmerDB and FoundationDB use another trick, which basically means that your transactions have to be very short-lived. So you basically say upfront, I want to do this and this, and let's do it as fast as possible. And I think, yes, there is this great book I would recommend reading. Uh, most of this stuff is covered there, so yeah, that's pretty much it. Questions? All right.